Uh, we come once again to our study in the book of Romans, and we are looking at these verses, Romans uh, 13, verses 8 to 10, and I remind you of this section that we are in where Paul has begun chapter 12 saying, since we have these mercies of God is justification, sanctification by the Holy Spirit, the international spread of the gospel, let's give our bodies as a living sacrifice to God and let's see our minds be transformed by Holy Spirit renewal. And then moving out of uh, that general urging comes these very specific urgings, humility in the context of the church, self-denying love to the church, self-denying love to one's enemies, submission to the government, and loving others with the law guiding that love. And so we come to verse 8 through 10, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now many come to a passage like Romans 13, verses 8 to 10, and they assume that there is some kind of opposition or tension between love and law. Many assume that the Mosaic law in its entirety uh, partakes of the same content and has the same duration. Many come to passages where law appears in the New Testament and tell us that all the Mosaic law has been replaced with a new covenant law of love. In order for us to be confident that we have an accurate understanding of these concepts that appear in our verses of fulfillment and law and love, it is necessary that we be familiar with what the Bible is saying about these verses as they appear in other passages of the Word of God. And knowing that Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus 19, what they say about these concepts is critically important, then that raises the question, how well do I know Leviticus 19? How well do I know Deuteronomy chapter 6? Since these are not the most familiar passages for us, we'll need to spend some time learning how these passages impact the thinking of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and ultimately ourselves concerning law and love. Now, the Mosaic Law ought to be viewed as moral, and civil and ceremonial. And you can find in Exodus 19 and 20, there's the focus on the moral law. What God says is right. And it is always right to have one God. It is always right to tell the truth. It is an abiding principle. God's standard doesn't change. But then in Exodus 21 through 24, it is largely the civil law. And then in Exodus 25 to 31 is largely the ceremonial law. But when Moses is up on the mount receiving the ceremonial law, he's also receiving the two tablets of the Ten Commandments that God has already spoken. So, this threefold distinction of the Mosaic Law, it's not new to me. It's found in our Westminster Confession of Faith and in our 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. It's found earlier in such men as Turretin and Calvin and back to Aquinas and all the way back to Justin Martyr. My goal in this study this morning is to demonstrate how God draws a distinction 
between these various aspects of the law, moral, civil, and ceremonial. And what I had anticipated was going to take, oh, maybe 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes at the beginning of a one sermon on verses 8 through 10, then became apparent that, oh, it's that little bit of background is going to crowd out the verses themselves. And then in the course of time, when you've got 29 pages of notes on background, it's like that's going to become two messages. And that's why your handout sheet is proposed as a, a little bit in a tentative way. I think we'll make it through Roman numeral one this morning. And I trust that you will see that God marks out the moral law as unique and worthy of God's special note and honor. And I hope that as you see this special honor that God puts on the Ten Commandments, that you will put a special honor on them as well. What we're going to see this morning, the unique honor given to the moral law, it was originally written on the hearts of man at creation. Those Ten Commandments were miraculously spoken by the voice of God to two million men, women, boys, and girls. Those Ten Commandments were miraculously written by the finger of God on two tablets of stone twice. They were uniquely placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant and they are uniquely promised as a new covenant blessing with them being written on the hearts. And we find that these Ten Commandments are uniquely still in effect in the New Testament. So written on the heart of man at creation. Then in the Mosaic economy, I don't know if you can really see it, there's a mountain in the background and a people uh, out in the front that standing for Sinai, when God speaks, the tablets there for when God writes, and then the Ark of the Covenant down below, something about the size of our communion table with the cherubim up over the top, and inside of that, the Ten Commandments, then the promise, if he wrote it on the heart at creation, the promise in Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, I'm going to write it on their hearts again. Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10 tell us uh, that uh, God is doing this since the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, with that, let's come, if you like to use it, the handout sheet and look at Roman number one. The unique honor. The unique honor given to the moral law in Scripture. And when I speak of the moral law, I'm speaking of the Ten Commandments. First of all, A, the Ten Commandments were written on the hearts of mankind at creation. And what we want to do this morning is something more of a Bible study, something of a survey. And so if you would like, uh, please feel free to turn in your copy of the Scriptures to Romans 2, if you want to use that pew Bible, it's page 1117, Romans 2 and verse 14. But seeing it as you hear it, for when the Gentiles do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They do not have a written copy of the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their consciences also bear, their conscience bear, also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, what law was written on the hearts of all men as they come from the hand of their Creator? I'm suggesting to you that it is the Ten Commandments. For when a non-Jewish farmer does not have his land to lie idle every seven years, and then in the 49th year, the year of Jubilee, is his conscience bothering him 
about that? And I say, no. But when that same non-Jewish farmer, in a fit of anger, kills one of the members of his family, how is he going to feel? Well, his conscience, informed by God's standard impressed on his being, is going to make him to feel miserable. He's going to have accusing thoughts in his mind. What a jerk you are for having done this to one of your own family members simply because you lost your temper. Every person on the planet has a little courtroom in their brain called the conscience, Todd Friel. The moral sense or conscience is as much a part of man as his leg or arm. It is given to all in a stronger or weaker degree. It may be strengthened by exercise. What theologian gave that? Well, try Thomas Jefferson. There is this broad understanding that each man and woman has this moral faculty of judgment. When we do something wrong, when we lie to someone close to us, we're troubled about that. Or at least, I hope, we are troubled about this. So uh, the Ten Commandments were originally written on the heart of man. Then when man rebelled against God, it, it's like that commandment was, was somehow partially erased. Or, or, or there's, if we were thinking of writing with chalk or writing on a blackboard and, and you just take your eraser and kind of smear, you lose something of it. It's hard to read the plain message of God's law when we're looking at men and women, boys and girls, who are cursed and under sin. They still have something of those Ten Commandments in them and on them, but it's not plain and evident. And that's why we need number two, B. The Ten Commandments were miraculously spoken by the voice of God to two million men, women, boys, and girls. Now, do you know of any other portion of the Word of God that was given to two million people at one time? I can't think of any. This is page 72 in the Pew Bible, Exodus 20 in verse 1, we read in the giving of the law, God spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So I want you to see that the Ten Commandments are given in a context of grace. They are given in a context of God's powerful grace. It's not that here are these commandments, and if you're really, really, really good with them, then you will earn my favor, and then I'll save you. But at least on the human level, God has already saved them. He's already manifested his grace, his great grace, in order to bring them out from under Pharaoh, who was opposing God, God delivered the ten plagues, water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the killing of the firstborn child to the point that Pharaoh finally sends the message. You can leave. Please leave. And you can take all of your families with you. And yes, you can take all of your livestock with you. And they send them away. Pharaoh then changes his heart. And the leading Egyptians say, what are we doing 
in letting all these servants, all these slaves go from us. So he gets his 600 select chariots and all of his others, but these at the front. And before the day is over, Pharaoh and all of his army is dead at the bottom of the Red Sea. And the Ten Commandments come in this context where God has reached into Egypt and brought them out by his powerful hand, where Moses has been saying, let my people go, let my people go, seven different times. And finally Pharaoh says, all right, you guys, get out of here. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of the nation of Israel was converted. Some were. But the Ten Commandments were never given so that one might work his or her way to God. Now, as we read how God solemnizes the moment of his giving of the Ten Commandments, let's look at Exodus 19, verses 16 and following. And I want you to ask yourself this question as I read. How often does this happen when God speaks. When God spoke to Samuel, when God spoke to David, when God spoke to the Apostle Paul, when he spoke to Peter, is this the way that God worked? Exodus 19 and verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast So all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because Yahweh had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And he no more gets up, and God says, you need to go back down there. And as strange as it may seem to us, God says, you need to go back down there and tell them not to cross the line. Don't be coming too close. I'm not sure what your response would have been. But I think that if I saw a mountain covered with fire and with smoke and with lightning and a trumpet blast and the thing is trembling... I don't feel myself necessarily magnetically drawn to that. I think I might need to be told, stay there at the bottom so that you're at least around when God speaks. But all of this is given here in Exodus 19 before we actually get to the Ten Commandments In Exodus chapter 20, let's go ahead and let me just notice verse 24 of Exodus 19. Go down and come up bringing Aaron with you. And I draw that to your attention because when you think of the golden calf, Aaron, you were brought up closer to God and you heard that second commandment and yet you engaged in that. So, Exodus 20, now beginning at verse 3, the first. You shall have no other gods before me, the second. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing manifest love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The third in verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
the fourth, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The fifth, now in verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The sixth, you shall not murder. The seventh, You shall not commit adultery. The eighth, you shall not steal. The ninth, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The tenth, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. It is sobering to us simply to read down through God's moral standard. But imagine if God were reading it to you from a mountain that is quaking and there is fire and there's the smoke and there's the... All of your senses are filled with a sense that God is here and God is making a point even to the trumpet that is blasting. What other occasion did God give a portion of his mind? When did he speak in this way? It is obvious, isn't it, that God is showing a special honor to these Ten Commandments. Let's look at their response, Exodus 20 and verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. And the people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And I want you to see something that we might pass over. Yes, there is this fearful thing that is going on. There there is this overwhelming response of the people to stand far off. But there's one guy that knows a sense of forgiveness and favor from God so that he can enter into communion with God, and we'll see it later, so that when he goes out by the temple, the, the... pillar of the cloud is going to come down and it's like God and Moses are speaking face to face. That is the grace of God in operation. Now thirdly, see, having seen God wrote it on the heart, having seen that God miraculously spoke his Ten Commandments from a quaking mountain to two million men, women, boys, and girls. Notice with me, thirdly, the Ten Commandments were miraculously written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. Twice. Now, page 76 in the Pew Bible. This is the first edition of the stone tablets. Exodus 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. And he's up on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. He spoke it. That's not enough. Well, don't you think that if you got two million people listening to the voice of God, that they could put their heads together and they could write it down, they could get it right? 
Well, that's not the way that God did it. He writes it down with his own finger so that it is written on stone. So, Exodus 31 and verse 18, And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And I'm going to suggest to you that the reason why is that when God wrote it on the heart of men, as men sinned, as they rebelled, there was a cloudiness that came over their thinking, and so they were not getting the law of God altogether right. And so not only is it spoken to the two million, God says, I want a sense of permanence with this law. So hand me the two tablets of stone, and I'm going to write on that stone with my finger. Now, is there another time where God gave his revelation by his writing on something? Well, I think of King Belshazzar there in the book of Daniel, and he's feasting with the vessels that have come from uh, Jerusalem, and there's that hand that appears writing no doubt, on a mortar type of wall, etching in there the message of judgment. But here, this one is even more special than that. There is this permanence. There is this clear record. And now, from Exodus chapter 32, uh, I believe page 82 in the Pew Bible, Exodus 32, verse 15 and following, Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. I think that in my skimming of this section, that during this section of 25 through 31, is when Moses hears about this is the temple. This is how you worship here. and this So so a lot of details. And memory serves me right, it is Moses wrote down what God said to him. But when it comes to the Ten Commandments, God says, no, sorry Moses, not even going to trust you with this. I am going to write this with my own finger. And now Exodus 32, verse 17, they're coming down, Joshua and Moses. When they, Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there was a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that had been made and burned it with the fire and ground it into powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. This is your God. You can drink your God. We can scatter it out here and your God doesn't stop us from destroying him. Some God this golden calf is. But then we want to see that there is a second edition. A second edition of the stone tablets. And I want you to consider something of how God's giving, if if he in the first speaking of the Ten Commandments, if there was grace in that, the powerful grace of all those ten plagues God had delivered them? Then what kind of grace do you see in the second edition of the Ten uh, Ten Commandments? It's marked by God's mercy and His grace that drew Moses into this intimate relationship with God. In Exodus 33, Moses has repented for the sins of, of the people with the golden calf. 
He interceded for Israel. And he said, listen, God, if you're not going to forgive them, then I want you to blot me out of your book. And of course, God was kind because God is a God of grace. And here we are now, uh, Exodus 33, and I invite your attention there. I have in my notes, Exodus 34 is page 87, so that shouldn't be far off. Exodus 33 and verse 9. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. Verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Here is the grace of God. Here is a picture of every Israelite of the kind of relationship that they could have with God, at least eventually, at least in heaven, of face to face. Now notice with me Exodus 33, verse 18. Moses said, please show me your glory. Moses is in a kind of relationship with God where he can't get enough. He's not saying, please God, go away from me. He's saying, I want more. Verse 19, and he said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see my face and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there was a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. A works righteousness God would be done with Israel after the golden calf, right? You speak to the two million of them in this amazing way to make a point. And in the 40 days and 40 nights that Moses is up on the mountain, the gold comes out of their ears and into the pot and out wonderfully comes the golden calf, or so Aaron's account of it is. But God says there will be a second edition of my writing on the rocks of stone. So Aaron, who had gone up closer, was intimately involved. Let us not trust in man. Exodus 34 now. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. You broke the tablets because they broke the commands of God. 34, now verse 4. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. He rose early in the morning, went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And this is very important. We want to see this. The God of grace is the God of the Ten Commandments. The Lord, verse 6, passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Let me stop right there. If he were not a God of grace, if he were not a God that was able to forgive men and women, boys and girls, sins, then why is he even saying, let's try this again, Moses. 
Let's do a do-over. Praise God that he is the God of the second chance. And the God of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighteenth chance. Back to the text. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. How many of us have associated this unfolding of God's glory, God revealing his glory to Moses, was at the very time Moses was up on the mountain to get the second edition of the tablets of stone. If I have known that, I have utterly forgotten it. But it makes an impression on me that he is the God of grace who is speaking here and writing with his finger. He is the God of the second chance. He is the God of mercy and of grace. He is the God of steadfast love. He is the God of forgiveness. Yet he is the God of holiness. So God's law in the heart has been marred by sin. He's given the spoken word. Not good enough. Not good enough to have all of them get together and the two million of them take a vote. Is this what he said? Yeah, I think that's what he said. Not enough. You can entrust the ceremonial law to Moses, but the moral law, God's going to write with his own finger on stone. Fourthly, D. Uniquely placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Uniquely placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Sorry, I don't have a page number for you, but I'll just read it. And then I, Moses, turned and came down from the mountain, put the tablets in the Ark that I had made, and there they are, as the Lord commanded me. The writer to the Hebrews talks in Hebrews 9 and verse 3 uh, about, well, we've got this temple and it's precinct around it. And, and then in the, the tabernacle itself, there's this, this tent building and there's the larger part and then there's the most holy. And it's inside the most holy that the Ark of the Covenant is. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the golden urn holding the manna Aaron's staff that budded, these reminding them of God's supernatural intervention to protect them and care for them and provide for them, and the tablets of the covenant, the two tables of the law written on by the finger of God. And above it, the Ark of the Covenant, were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Hebrews 9, 3 through 5. This is a very special honor. Let's put on the Ten Commandments. What, what are we going to do with them? What are we going to, we're going to put them into the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant's going into the temple. No, not in the big room, in the little room. That special place of God's presence. And what a wonderful picture of the gospel, isn't it? There's the mercy seat where the high priest is going to come in once a year, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, coming in with one of the blood of those rams, one's the scapegoat let out to go into the wilderness to die. The blood of the other comes in, sprinkles the mercy seat which is right above the tablets of the law. Here is the reminder of everything that I have done wrong and everything you have done wrong. And right above it is the picture of the blood of Christ being applied to all of our violations. There's something special about these ten Ten Commandments. Fifthly, 
uniquely promised as a new covenant blessing. Now, Jeremiah 31, 31. This is page 784 in the Pew Bible. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. The old covenant being highlighted here is the Mosaic covenant. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, now verse 33, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one his neighbor and each his brother, saying, teach each his neighbor and his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. There was grace in the Abrahamic covenant. There was grace in the Mosaic covenant. But there is more grace in the covenant instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ, which is all the one and the same covenant. Well, what are the covenant blessings here? Well, one is regenerate church membership in the covenant community. In the church nation, yet some who were believers, many who were not, so that every man has got plenty of individuals for him to speak to, saying, you need to know the Lord. You need to believe in God. You need to be regenerated. Within the covenant community, within the church, the great goal, the ideal, the plan, is that of a regenerate church membership. And if somebody within the church memberships, membership needs to be evangelized, they need to be out of the membership until they are truly converted. But then there is a definitive accomplishment of forgiveness. Forgiveness has been talked about. But once when Jesus comes... As Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper the night before he goes to the cross, this is the blood of the new covenant. He's talking about a definitive accomplishment of our forgiveness. It's been pictured in the time when the priest would come in with his blood of uh, the Day of Atonement ram. It's pictured there but it's not accomplished until Jesus dies on the cross. And then this third benefit of blessing is that I'm going to write my law on their heart. Yeah, I wrote it on a stone, and I told a whole bunch of them that this is what I expected of them, but I'm going to do something even better in the New Covenant community. Yes, he did this for believers in the Old Testament, but it's in a highlighted way. There is more grace. So Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 quote Jeremiah 31 and say that Jesus is better, a heavenly temple is better, and Jesus' sacrifice is better, and having the law in our hearts is better. Now, what law is going to be written on the hearts? Well, turn with me, 2 Corinthians 3, page 1146. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and following. In the interest of time, verse 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink. There's the first contrast and comparison. It is to an ink letter but you're a real person, you don't have ink on you, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. 
So what was written in the second contrast and comparison? What was written on the tablets of stone back in Moses' day, now I'm writing on hearts. And Psalm 40 and verse 8 is going to say, your law is in my heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is going to say, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, is a new creation. The old things have passed away and the new has come. That's another way of saying God has put his law in our hearts so that I want to tell the truth. I want to not steal. I want to work to provide something for others. So we come to F. Uniquely still in force. Uniquely still in effect in the New Testament. Page 992, Matthew 27, 45 and following. The ceremonial law falls away. Here's the account of Jesus being on the cross. We're told in verse 45, it's noon. And from noon to three, the three hours of darkness. And it's out as shortly after that time that Jesus cries out with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. And the very next verse, 2751 of Matthew. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Many marvelous things that happened in conjunction with Jesus dying as our sacrifice. So when was the temple veil torn at the moment that Jesus died? Why was it torn from the top to the bottom? To show that it is God reaching in and ripping that tent open to give access to the people of God. Ceremonial law is gone. Hebrews 8 and verse 7, if the first covenant had been faultless, then there, no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant, something better than the Mosaic worship. We got a better sacrifice. We got a better tabernacle. Everything is better with Jesus. Ceremonial has gone. The civil law of Israel falls away. Romans 2, 28, we've seen this. For he is not a Jew as one outwardly, nor a circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. New covenant community does not maintain a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. It's one community. Romans 9 and verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Not all of those who have Abraham's DNA are a part of the true and spiritual Israel of God. The children of the flesh, verse 8, are not the children of God. And on it goes, Ephesians 2, you've got Israel, and if you're a Gentile, you're separated. You're away from the, the saving purposes of God. But now Jew and Gentile are brought together in the same place through the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God. To where you come to Galatians 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, but all are one in Christ. And if you have faith, then you are a child of Abraham. Civil law is gone. Ceremonial law is gone. And now, one last passage. 
from Matthew chapter 5, page 963. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Verse 21, the sixth commandment. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. But now you need to forget this because I am initiating a new covenant law of love. So you don't need anything of my moral statements. You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. But I'm telling you, the sixth commandment is even more spiritual and more specific in its application. If you say, you fool, you've committed verbal murder. And if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, you've committed mental murder. So you thought that it was only pulling a knife out and gutting someone. But if you sin with your tongue, if you sin with your mind, you've still broken this commandment. Matthew 5, verse 27. You shall not commit adultery. Does Jesus take the seventh commandment and toss it over his shoulder and say, we don't need that no more? No. He spiritualizes the application. You shall not commit adultery. The kind of adultery that is physical and, and outward, and, and if you're going to do it, it involves your hand. But there's another kind of adultery that involves your eye, your eye and your mind, and there's nothing that's been touched. But for that one who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It doesn't sound like Jesus tossed the seventh commandment over his shoulder. He intensified it. But then notice what he also does with it. He says if, you're, if your right hand is involved in physical adultery and you continue in that, then you're going to be destroyed in a place called hell. And if your eye connected to your brain is involved in the kind of adultery that does not involve touch, and you continue in that adultery, you're going to the same place called hell. This is Jesus using the law of God as a mirror. And he says, here's my law regarding anger. Have you killed anybody? Well, no, not actually. I didn't shoot anybody. I haven't knifed anybody. Yeah, well, have you been angry with them? I'm guilty. Have you said thou fool? So Jesus takes the sixth commandment, holds it up in front and says, get a good look at yourself. He holds up the seventh commandment. Get a good look at yourself. Has there been mental lust? Any continuing violations will lead us to the place of hell, and so we need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. And here's that wonderful message of the gospel there uh, with the mercy seat. All of our sins can be found out by looking at those two tables of the law. Have I been God sitting on the throne? Well, then you have not had one God before you. Have I lied? Have I been impure? Have I been coveting? And it's that command that brought grief to the rich young ruler. Because the Tenth Commandment is not about out here with my hands or my feet. The Tenth Commandment is only here between my ears. Oh, man, you mean the law of God applies to the way that I think? I didn't even do anything, God. Guilty. If you've not been content, you're guilty. 
So all the sins I've ever committed, represented there by those Ten Commandments, leading me to see what I look like. But the blood of Jesus Christ comes and is applied on the mercy seat that's over the top of those Ten Commandments. And Romans 3 teaches us that the law comes so that every mouth will be stopped. You'll be done making excuses. You'll be done trying to defend yourself. But there is still one thing to say. And what do I need to say if I'm not going to defend myself? We say, I repent and I believe. I am sorry for the mountain of my sins. Will you please forgive me, Lord Jesus Christ? Will you please receive the mountain of my sins and give me in exchange the greater mountain of your perfect righteousness? Please, Father in heaven, have the sprinkled blood of your Son on me and on my sin. Well, may God take this study and write it on our hearts that we would appreciate the truth, the clarity of God's law, but any time we think of that, we need to think of his mercy and his grace that comes in alongside of it or there would never be a republishing of those ten words on the commandment, on the stones. There would be no Ark of the Covenant with its ten commandments and the blood on the mercy seat. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would do a mighty work in our hearts in calling all of us to appreciate the righteousness of your standard and give to us a willingness to own our own selfishness, our headstrong ways, and cover us under the blood of your Son. And we pray, our God, that you would do that in the hearts of uh, someone sitting here this morning, someone under the sound of my voice, manifest your grace and your mercy through the wonderful merits of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's sing in closing. Him number.